Hey, welcome to this tutorial series. We're going to be building some really cool stuff out of the Web Audio API, and we're going to be using React.js to build our user interfaces. And it makes for some pretty interesting portfolio projects. This is a drum machine I made. Here's a synth I built. Here's another synthesizer I made, but this one uses a technique called frequency modulation synthesis. And it also has this interesting cube display that I built out of React Spring. So I'm going to assume that you have a pretty good understanding of React, but we're going to start from square one with the audio stuff. So if you have a background in music production or audio engineering, you can probably skip forward to the next video, but this might be helpful review for a lot of people anyway. A good place to start is the way that speakers work. If you look at a speaker, you're always going to see these cones. And the way that these cones work is that behind them, on the back of them, there's a coil and electrical currents run through that coil. And behind that coil is a magnet. And the way that the electrical currents run through that coil is going to make the whole cone get pulled towards the magnet or pushed away from it. This is going to push air particles away from the speaker. It's going to compress waves of them that will expand outward away from the speaker. So this has got to be the best visual I've ever seen for how waves work. You can imagine that this red thing right here is our speaker cone, and as it moves forward, it's pushing air particles together, and then as it moves backwards, it's creating a section of air that is less compressed. And then that wave of compression moves through these particles. So the particles move a little bit, but they're not moving all the way across this thing. They're mostly moving back and forth in their own little neighborhood. It's very similar to how waves move through water. It's like force moving through the water. It's not the water itself moving. It moves up and down, but it's actually uh, the force that's moving forward through the water. The water, for the most part, stays at its location while the wave travels through it. Same thing here. The wave is going to be this wave of compression that's going to travel through the air particles in the air. And when you see waves graphed like this, the way you can think about it is that from here to here is one full cycle because it's one full up and down. And how fast that repeats is going to be the frequency, like how high or low the pitch is. So this would be a lower, bassier sound, and this would be a much higher frequency sound because it's repeating much faster. It's taking less time to repeat these cycles. The amplitude, how loud it's going to be, is going to be how far from the center, if you imagined a center line splitting the middle of this, it's how far these peaks and valleys are getting away from that center. That's going to be how loud the sound is. The shape of the wave is going to determine the timbre of the sound, or its texture, the way it sounds. You could be playing the same note or frequency on a violin or a piano or any other instrument and even though you're playing the same note they could sound very different because they'll have different timbre or their waves will have different shapes to them but they can still be playing at the same pitch because even if they have a different shape that cycle as long as it's repeating at the same speed as the cycles of another instrument then they're going to have the same pitch but that cycle itself could have a very, very different shape. So you can think about the wave graph here as representing the actual sound, the wave of compression that's traveling through the air particles. You can think about it as representing the position of the speaker cone, how far forward or back it is. And you can think about it as the electrical current that's running through the coil on the back of the speaker cone, which is going to either pull it towards the magnet or push it away from the magnet because the electrical current can either be positive or negative. You can also think about this in a kind of abstract sense as just a value that's changing over time and repeating cycles of the same pattern over and over and over again. 
So we call that repetition of a value changing over time oscillation. And inside your computer, you can have oscillators and they're just gonna be values that change over time and are repeating cycles of the same pattern. So the oscillator in our computer can be turned into an electrical signal, which can then go tell the speaker how to move in order to make the sounds that we want. This is a sine wave, which is basically the simplest sound that we can have. We can also have a square wave, a triangle wave, and a sawtooth wave. They're all going to have different kinds of tones, different timbres, different textures of their sound because they all have different shapes to the cycles that they're repeating. But if we repeat their cycles at the same speed, then they'll still give us the same note, just with a different texture to the sound. So the signal that we put out can only have so much amplitude because if it has too much amplitude, then it could damage the actual speaker itself because if the electrical current running through the coil on the back of the speaker cone is too strong, it can push it too far forward or pull it too far back and actually destroy the speaker cone itself. So what we'll do a lot of the time is we'll use compressors and limiters to deal with this. So a compressor is just going to take the loudest points of a sound and the quietest points of the sound, and it's going to reduce the space between them. It's going to reduce the difference between them. Um, so it's going to bring all the loudest peaks down, basically, and sort of flatten the sound out a little bit. And then makeup gain will be applied so that it can go back and be peaking at the exact same amplitude, but the sound will be more filled out now. This sound over here is going to be taking up more of that amplitude space that we have to work with. And so this will be perceived as louder than this sound, even though they're both peaking at the exact same amplitude because of how this is filled out more. So this is why genres like dubstep or metal will sound louder to the human ear, even if they're played at the same volume as classical music, because classical music is going to have a wider dynamic range, a wider difference between the loudest sound and the quietest sound in the mix. A limiter is just a very intense compressor that's going to flatten off the sound entirely after a certain point and not let any sounds in that audio have an amplitude that is higher than a certain point. And you would throw something like that on the end of your audio pipeline, on your entire mix, on all of your instruments together, in order to not let any of them have an amplitude that goes beyond a certain point so that you're not going to damage some speakers or have your audio signal be distorted in some way that you don't want. A regular compressor is just a less intense version of that. Instead of completely flattening it off, it's going to just reduce the dynamic range a bit. And you can use that on your mix altogether. You can also use that on individual instruments within your mix. Compressors you won't use to define an absolute limit that you don't want crossed. You'll more so use them just to fatten up sounds and use up more of the amplitude space that we have in the range that's safe to use. Distortion basically means that we take a wave and we increase its amplitude, but we cut it off at a certain place. We've clipped it there and there. So it's going to make it louder and increase the amplitude, but it's also going to change the timbre, the harmonics a little bit, because it's changing the shape of that wave. So this is a different kind of graph. This is not showing us a waveform. What this is showing us is on its x-axis are frequencies from low to high pitch and then its y-axis is showing us how loud those frequencies are. So these are all filters. That's a notch filter, this is a notch filter, and this is a notch filter. They affect the frequencies that are inside of their band, and that band can be wider or thinner. When they have negative gain like that, it's cutting away those frequencies. When it has positive gain, it's boosting those frequencies. You can also see on this side, there's a high shelf filter which is reducing all of the very high frequencies. You could do the opposite. You could boost the high frequencies if you wanted to with a high shelf. And then you've got a low shelf filter down here, which is reducing the low, low end of this sound. And again, you could do the opposite with that shelf filter. You could boost the low end with the low shelf filter if you were to give it positive gain. There's another good graphic right here. And this one's showing us a high pass filter down here which is going to cut off all the frequencies below its cutoff frequency, and it's going to let the frequencies that are higher than its cutoff frequency, it's gonna let those pass through. And then you've got a low pass filter over here, which is doing the exact opposite. It's going to cut off all of the frequencies that are above its 
cutoff frequency and it's going to let all of the lower frequencies pass through it. Reverb is just when we have our sound sources. It could be a speaker or a person talking or anything that makes a sound. It's making those waves of compression that are traveling through the air. And if it's in a room with walls or any kind of space with surfaces, those waves of compression are going to bounce off of those surfaces and then reflect. So we've got something that makes a sound and that sound is going to reach the listener first through the direct path between the source of the sound and the listener. But there's also going to be a bunch of other paths where that sound is bouncing off of the surfaces and reaching the listeners slightly later than the original dry sound that's reaching the listeners through the direct sound path. So we call that direct sound without any reverb, that's the dry sound or the dry signal. And then all of the audio signal that is produced from these reflections is going to be considered the wet signal or the wet sound. This looks like probably a drum hit, maybe a snare, and this is the exact same thing but with some reverb on it. And so there's some reflections coming in after the original dry signal, which has also been decreased a little bit. Over here, we've got even more reverb and even less of the original dry signal. And that's because we're going to change the ratio between the wet and the dry signals of an effect in order to basically turn it up or turn it down to increase or reduce its intensity. We're also going to use these terms dry and wet to apply to all of our audio effects, not just reverb. So the dry will always be the completely unprocessed, normal signal without any effect on it, and the wet will be the signal where it has been completely run through the effect. So 100% wet would just be only run through the effect. 100% dry would be no effect on it. ADSR is a concept that just describes the volume of a sound over time. So this is the beginning of a sound, and it's rising up to its peak volume, and then it's going to decrease a little bit, and the sustain is going to be the volume that it sort of rests at as long as you're holding the note down. And then right here would be the time where you release the note, and the release is going to be how long in between the time that you release the note and the time that the sound totally fades away. Delay you can think about basically as an echo. You can do all kinds of crazy timings and patterns with it, but it's pretty much just an echo. So the way you can think about the web audio API part of what we're gonna be building is basically just a big pipeline of audio sources, whether they're oscillators or MP3 files, and they're gonna be feeding their signal down through a big pipeline that's going to end at the destination, which is gonna be your computer speakers or whatever you're hooked up to. And here we can see we've got three audio sources. They're all passing into one effect each. Each of those effects is then feeding into both these dries and these wets. These are just gain nodes. You can basically think about them as a volume knob. And then these wets are feeding into a reverb and then feeding into the compressor and the destination. The dries also feed into the compressor and then the destination. So if you wanted to increase the amount of reverb on your sound, you would increase the gain or the volume on these wets and you would decrease it on these dries. If you wanted to do the opposite, if you wanted to decrease the amount of reverb on your sound, you would decrease the gain or the volume on these wets and you would increase it on these dries so that your signal would bypass this reverb on its way from your sound sources to the destination. So yeah, that concludes our review of the conceptual side of things for now. In the next video, we're going to actually dive into the Web Audio API and start making some sounds with it in our console.